How do you create an ongoing steady flow of leads coming into your consulting business? Well, you can create your own pipeline. We're going to hear today from David Strasser on exactly how to do that. Hey there, it is Samantha Hartley of the Profitable Joyful Consulting Podcast. Uh, throughout this show, I'm always returning to the theme of how to generate leads for your business. I mean, this is the only way the business is going to work. Like the only way we can grow is if we bring in new clients and generating leads can be a real challenge for some people. And even if you really rock at it, I think you're going to really enjoy the topic today. It's about creating your own pipeline. So often consultants are dependent upon referrals. They're dependent on um, past clients coming back and working with them and really bringing new leads into the business is such a big opportunity. Uh, David is going to share a unique technique that he has used to do this. And you're going to hear about his very interesting background, uh, the way he started his business, um, his life as a consultant, and then what he's been doing now uh, since he left consulting and took a day job, why he did that, by the way and uh, how he is generating his own pipeline in his role as a sales director for this company. So I think you're really gonna enjoy this conversation. David Strasser is the host of the smash hit small business growth podcast, Shark Bite Biz, a member of the Forbes Business Development Council, a Harvard Business Review Advisory Council member, general manager of the Northeast region for Vision 33, and CEO of his own media company, Dead Brands LLC. David Strasser, welcome to the Profitable Joyful Consulting Podcast. Hey, Samantha. Thank you so much for allowing me to come on to your show. We have plenty in common, and I really just can't wait to discuss with you and your viewers all the awesome stuff that I think both of us are doing. Yes. Uh, one of the big things that we have in common is um, what well, we have video podcasts, but uh, a commitment to business growth. And I loved learning this about you and hearing about this on your show, uh, the way that you focus on business growth and um, not just in uh, your professional work, but also on the Shark Bite yeah, Biz, Shark Bite Biz. Shark yes. Bite Biz uh, podcast. Yep. Um, so uh, would we start, can we kind of dial back to the beginning and um, start with something that you and I also have in common, which is that you began your career, your professional career in a foreign country. Yeah, yeah. So it was kind of kind of crazy. I'm originally from rural Pennsylvania, and I ended up uh, just getting tired of it. <laughs> and, you know, it's one of those places, especially back then, where you have ideas. It's like, no, you can't do that. No, that's dumb. You know, I just got tired of having ideas and everybody around me saying no. So it's like, I want to get out of here. I ended up then... It was supposed to be London, but what happened was my buddy watched this movie called Born in East L.A. Uh, that stars Cheech Marin. So instead of London, we ended up moving to Tijuana over that movie. <laughs> and it's two months after September 11th. And I did live in a rougher neighborhood for most of my time living in Tijuana, which many would consider, you know, like a ghetto, a literal, yeah. literal Tijuana ghetto where it's dirt roads, outhouses. Um some of the poorest, the poorest people that you can imagine, you know, it was pretty, pretty humbling experience, you know, living really, I think for that amount of time in that, you know, that part of the world and just seeing things through a different lens. Yeah, it does. It does. And so you began a business while you were there. Yeah, you know, it was really around... 2000s, you know, eight ish, something like that, where, you know, it was really, really hard to find yeah. a job. You know, the, the economy was in wreck. Um, you know, I'm technically a millennial, but I, I categorize myself as a zennial mm -hmm. because, you know, being at that age, I mean, yeah. a lot of people like me, they already had families and were in the workforce for many years when the economy collapsed. Mm -hmm. And that's where it, it was very rough. I wasn't able to find work. It, mm -hmm. it was, you know, some of the downright hardest times of my life. Uh, what I was able to find, though, and this was, I don't know, just kind of out of necessity, was I was able to discover, well, I'm fluent in Spanish. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people in Mexico. Um, why don't I try, like, bringing American products down into Mexico, especially during this time period? I find myself really working mostly with tech companies 
and uh, eventually found myself working in technology, like tourist te uh, technology, oh, wow. as far as the border cameras, stuff like that. Now, when I say border cameras, don't think I'm talking about like cameras looking for people crossing the border, like jumping a fence or something like that. I'm talking about the lines because you never know how long the line is to get into the United States. Okay. It could be 30 minutes. It could be six hours long. Mm -hmm. So what we did was, uh, you know, we set up cameras there focused on key points of the border that daily border travelers like myself would kind of know by looking at these small, quick video clips. Okay. This is where the line is. Okay. And based mm -hmm. upon that, this is the speed. Okay. I'm going to need two hours to get across the border today. And, you know, it's a pretty cool, successful service because, I mean, they do cross hundreds yeah. of thousands of people through Tijuana to San Diego every single day. Yeah. Yeah. So what I hear in this just essentially is uh, kind of scrappiness and um, that generally like entrepreneurial spirit of like, uh, I don't have something going on. I need to have something going on. And that's where a lot of us will get our hustle from. It's like, mm -hmm. you, you have the fire when you, when you need it. Um, but it's I like, really had to hustle. <laughs> it was gritty. It was very gritty. It was, hard. Real. it, it was, real. uh, fighting tooth and nail just to make a living. And, you know, it's also the point where I decided that maybe it's a good time to study as well, too. Mm -hmm. So I did, I started with a uh, college. I did Penn state world campus um which uh is pretty cool because they've written up many articles on me as being one of their their big success stories so uh nice. that was really really awesome to have happened but it it, it was you know trying yeah. to do whatever i could to make ends meet but you have to remember i'm doing these contracts that yeah. call for me to do some activities but i still have to be out there finding more work and yep. that's where eventually it killed me after so many years yeah <laughs> right well so uh when it does sustain us though i think mm -hmm. uh figuring out what problem can i solve uh and how can i do this and i think a lot of times you know i was part of businesses um when i was uh because i also began my professional career overseas i was in russia and the first things that we did were like import american stuff over into russia like there's anytime you're in an international uh environment the trade opportunities seems are like there. that that that's like the low-hanging fruit right totally low-hanging fruit exactly i really feel that created like an adaptability that comes mm -hmm. up in entrepreneurship. And I think, so I really see the hustle. I see this kind of need to identify a problem and solve it. Uh, and, you know, the topic that I wanted to talk to you about today is like creating your own pipeline. And what I think is I really try to instill in my clients is like, it's impossible to create your own pipeline unless you are, you know, you have the hustle. And as you said, like right. I have a thing going on, but I still need to be getting clients. Uh, and mm -hmm. so it's really a lot of like spinning multiple plates, which can be, oh, yeah. it can be stressful. And I think that's, this is where we kind of find out, is this the thing that um, you want to spend your time doing, or do you not want to spend mm -hmm. your time doing that? So what do yeah. you think in terms of creating your pipeline what would you say are like the major factors that allow you to do that so you have to think you know there's covid there's pre-covid and i don't know can i say that we're in a post-covid world or an almost <laughs> post-covid world at this point what what's sure we in? so i sure hope so <laughs> <laughs> so you know before covid one of the things that i did was i i i networked a lot and one of my keys to networking is I don't try to meet every single person in the room. I mean, if I can, because there's only 10 people there, yeah, I'll do yeah. it. But uh, if you're in a, a larger venue where there could be 50 or 100 or a couple hundred people, uh, it's pretty hard to do that. And it, it's more, you know, okay, I want to find one reliable contact from this this venue this this event whether it is somebody that can present a business opportunity someone who could be a potential lead a partner um or even someone who is actually pretty cool and i might want to be friends yeah. with them you yeah. know uh you know where, where it's just like holy cow we align so i always go there with the goal in mind is to come out of there with something of value and what that item of value is differs, I think, for everybody and yeah. what you're looking for at that point. Now, that's one part of the game. The other part of the game is that I learned that, I mean, it is a hustle if you're just trying to go to networking event after networking event after networking event. 
um, yeah, you get boring, t- a little tired. I mean, yeah, they're interesting, but I don't know. I, there's just a point where it's like, is it really worth it for me? And that's where I kind of decided to flip the script. Uh, I, you know, I listened to Jeffrey Gittimer's little, little Red Book of Selling. Yeah. Okay. And he said, you know what the number one way to get leads is? No. Free speech. Getting out there and speaking as much as you can. Because, mm-hmm. you know, networking it oftentimes, you know, it's like you're trying to find a needle in a haystack. So mm-hmm. what I did was I reversed the tables like, OK, I'm going to bring all those needles to me. And I did that a couple of different ways. Pre-COVID, I was doing live shows. So we called it the (laughs) anti-luncheon because we didn't want people to think that it was a regular networking event. We were going to do things different. I mean, our appetizers were chocolate cake. So, (laughs) you know, and like we had an incredible menu, very creative chefs that were able to design these uh you know what started dessert first and it was just that anti-luncheon theme it would have people that you would not think of typical traditional speakers at the event um and like some of the keynote speakers we would have we had william hung twice for example uh you know from uh american American idol Idol, she Uh bangs yeah 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 we we've had him and he has an incredible business story about reaching your dreams you know and how to handle fame and stuff like that but originally people were like william hung why are you having him like what does he (laughs) have to do with business Uh and like well first off he's gonna do she bangs during uh the happy hour (laughs) okay and and Uh second off uh he does have an inspiring story for business owners as far as reaching your dreams. So there, there's that. And then the other one that we did was with uh, the verb pipe with Brian Vander Ark, uh, who sings the the world famous song, formerly number one hit, uh, yeah. The Freshman, you know, uh-huh. and his, his story about just the ups and downs, but fighting through it so that you can continue. So we, we, we basically did a networking event, the ones that I was burnt out of doing, yeah. but we would fill the room with 100 to 150 different executives, usually executives, small business owners. Um, You know, there was a lot of people that may have been one or two person shops, like a small insurance agency or a small financial services company. And we would pack that luncheon with the anti-luncheon phenomenon. So I tried to do my own spin, own take. You got to remember, I was doing this out in LA as well too, which I mean, fighting for anybody's, you know, mind attention. space, yeah. you're right, and attention, and to draw them to an event, it's hard because there's so much competition out there. For this sure. is how we were able to, to do it. And, you know, but we were planning on doing that out here. We were going to call it the, uh, the Northeast Roadshow. Yeah. And we were going to do it throughout the, the Northeast and yeah. think of minor league baseball cities. Uh-huh. But then COVID hit. So yeah. we ended up having to cancel it. So because of that, you know, at first it was like, okay, you know, this is just going to be delayed. Obviously, we were thinking two weeks, you know, stop the curve or whatever it was, Mm -hmm. and we'd be done with it. And come May, it's kind of like, well, this looks like it's not going away. So that's where the podcast came in, Shark Bite Biz. And it's like, well, if I can't do the live events then i'm going to do the next best thing of networking with people by doing the podcast itself mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so i really love that can you uh, uh, delve a little more deeply into how you actually got people into the room in la is this like email campaigns or are you um, okay you know contacting people you've you've talked to before because i do think yeah, yeah. Uh, i think uh, people do um events and i think we're going to begin to do more events and it is difficult or it can be difficult to get people in the room so especially in la as you said Yeah, yeah. So the very first rule of doing your event is make sure that I I would say you have to think of it like you're doing it um, unselfishly. That's Mm -hmm. one of my big my big points, because if your cohorts, you know, your your speakers that you're doing the show with stuff like that, if they think that you're just doing the show, just for you and you know your ROI and your interest, you're not going to get 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 a lot of buy-in. So mm-hmm. for me personally, I always told everybody like, "Hey, you people 
are the rock stars of the show. I'm going to make you guys look amazing mm-hmm. and put you in the best possible position. Okay. Yeah. Because then ultimately it reflects upon me, you know, mm-hmm. and yeah. it boosts me up. It's, you know, what goes around comes around. Right. So that's the message I sent to the speakers, to the sponsors, stuff like that. And it was also a sense of, you know, shared responsibility. Like, hey, you know, we have um, maybe eight speakers, including the one discussion panel that we had uh, Mm -hmm. that would be at the show. So like everybody, you know, pull in 10 people from your network. Uh Everybody has at least 10 people in their network that can come, you know, and then also partnering with somebody like we use the city club in Los Angeles, which Mm -hmm. I absolutely loved. Okay. Uh, We use the city club. So they have their membership. They'd be promoting it as well too. But you Mm -hmm. mean, you could do the same thing with a local chamber of commerce sure. or something yep. like that yep. you know you, you you pair up with another agency that has the membership and you know it helps get the word out i mean we did emails uh like we pulled uh at my during my day job vision 33 we ended up pulling all the clients that were within a uh 60 60 or 70 mile radius of downtown Los Angeles that we had in our HubSpot database Mm -hmm. and we were mailing them you know I also had my own personal list as well too that was um, I think in MailChimp and we were emailing them and you know between everybody doing their work together emailing their clients I mean it made sure that we had a packed room every single time amazing it's great. And I love the the spirit of generosity that you're referencing. So you you really take on more of a role of an event producer mm-hmm. and um, bringing value to people, which puts that kind of like aura of value over you. So right. then how do you follow up and turn that into business? Okay. Yeah. So at that time, when I first did the first, especially the first show, like I, I was more in a moderator type position. I would moderate the discussion panel i had intro to the speakers stuff like that i was not as comfortable publicly speaking as Mm -hmm, i am mm -hmm. now Uh, i've learned a lot with the podcast uh you know if i had to do things over i probably would have a a more of a keynote type speaking spot but Mm -hmm. hey you know it is what it is yeah we've all the the way that I made sure that we were able to get business and we got multi-million dollar deals off of these events was the speakers. That's the key. Okay. If you're putting on an event where you're looking for the ROI. Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, this is how am I going to make sure the speakers get their ROI too? I've got to look at it from their point of view. It's the synergy of making sure that everybody compliments each other Mm -hmm. that you're on topic that you have a core theme for the event Mm -hmm. and that way then you're targeting that type of audience like for Mm -hmm. example we had one that was uh manufacturing or not manufacturing sorry it was uh distribution Mm -hmm. about the uh distributing because there's a lot of distributors that are based out of la yeah uh you know because maybe they manufacture in china and in la or orange county that's where they have their distribution offices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we made sure that we had a theme for the event and then the speakers lined up with that theme. So that way, like, for example, a good buddy of mine, James Shea, he's the CEO and uh, founder of a marketing firm called uh, Cybertegic. He ended up bringing one of his customers because he does a lot Mm -hmm. of e-commerce and he brought one of his customers that makes and moves products from China, they sell throughout the U.S. Just so happens, like since he's their marketing partner, he they actually he was doing so so good. Their technical systems could not handle the quantity wow. of orders that they were getting, yeah. and he was like, "No, no, no, no! I don't want to lose money. We need to get you a new system." And he brought him to the event, and six weeks later, you know that that was a multi million dollar deal right yeah. there. It was that large of an opportunity, but it's because <laughs> of that synergy. Yeah. And having that core theme and everybody working towards the same goal mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. we were able to pull together. 
Yeah, I love that. And it really illustrates the what I think is the beauty and the opportunity in networking, which is it's not who you know, and it's not necessarily mm -hmm. who they know. It can be like the, those outer layers of who they know. Right. Um, and again, I think this is, you know, what I always say in, um, in networking is to kind of look for that spark. Uh, and you're going to find your people, you're going to find your opportunity. And I, mm -hmm. I think coming to it with that kind of generosity and like open-mindedness uh, is, is how that kind of thing can happen. So it's, oh, um, yeah, definitely. you know, your I person, think... your collaborator it... trusts you to bring mm -hmm. their big client to that event. Like that's, that kind of thing is important. If you go into it, you know, with your ego or thinking like, Hey, you know, yeah. I'm the one that's going to bring her home to bank, you know, the people that are involved with the event, they're obviously business professionals. They're, they probably aren't that dumb, you know, they're probably somewhat smarter. They won't be speaking at your event. They're going to yeah. stiff that up pretty quick. Yeah. So it's transparency. Like, Hey, we all want to earn business. We all want to do it together. It's a collaborative effort. And, you know, pull your weight, you know, everybody had their codes we were tracking it and me mm -hmm. leading the charge was pushing this. So it, it ended up being, you know, pretty awesome. We did do three events uh, because, you know, they were spread over about uh, 18. Uh, it was like one every six months mm -hmm. up until I moved to Philly. Right. So it, it was pretty, pretty successful and kind of bummed that it never took off out here because of COVID. But yeah. then again, you know, I ended up starting the podcast and I would say doing the podcast actually ended up being maybe even way better because I've met so many awesome people doing the podcast mm -hmm. and I've met them intimately, like yeah. you and me, like how we're talking right now, yeah. you know more about me than uh, in this interview than you probably would have ever if we just met at a networking event. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And you get to spend that kind of quality time together. I, I love that idea. So um, you are known as the king of uh, creating your own pipeline. And I love that. Um, it uh, I love the king of anything that cracks me up in a good way. So, um, yeah. so you took a day job, you left consulting and then yep. uh, and started to work for a company. So can you talk a little bit about like what drove your decision to do that? Yeah, I mean, it came down to being burnt out. Uh, it's a funny story, actually. One of my clients uh, who ended up becoming personal friends of me, he was like, you know, you're doing, he was launching a side business kind of dream that he had. And I was working on it kind of as a project manager. It was a US based job, typically didn't do it. It was one of those things that I did it for a friend of a friend. And, you know, after six months of working with this guy, he was pretty much like, dude, you're killing yourself. Uh -huh, okay. Uh -huh. you, you're so amazing. You're so talented. Trust me, come work at my job. You mm. know, come work where I work. And you're going to see that your whole world will change. You'll get out of that daily grind and it'll allow you to keep being an entrepreneur and making money, yeah. you know, a yeah. lot easier. And you have a little bit more security than just doing the 80 to 90 hour weeks that you're doing now between trying to find more business and completing all this project work. Yes. So that's kind of what sold me onto giving up the consulting business and then moving on to, you know, working full time with Vision 33. Amazing. So, you know, it, it was because I mean, honestly, I love getting sales. There is nothing better than getting a sale. It gives me goosebumps. Yeah. It makes the, you know, the uh, hair on my arms. It makes it stand <laughs> up, you know, whether it's me or whether it's yeah. one of my sales reps, I get the deal, yeah. whether it's a big deal or a small deal. It excites me, but mm -hmm. I didn't feel fulfilled as a sales rep because I had so much more potential, I ability to manage others, drive a sales team, you know, negotiate yeah. other things. Because well, you've been an entrepreneur. So I think you've right. done the bigger, the bigger thing. And that's where the promotion to be the general manager for the Northeast and the East Coast really allowed me to utilize all of my skills. Love it. Well, I think that also speaks to you found a really good company that knows how to treat you well and um, mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, to elevate you with opportunities and things like that. And also, I think it's a really nice match for your skill set. So um, right. I do acknowledge that uh, some of my listeners are going to hear this and think, uh oh, 
um, maybe a better thing for me should be to go and get a day job. And I think it's absolutely critical that they hear me say, if you feel that way and you can find a situation like David has found, then by all means do go get that yeah. day job. I think it's to me, consulting is really, if it's, it's gotta be like the most right thing for you. And uh, mm -hmm. you also said something that I think is really critical. You know, our, our work as consultants has to be about a nice balance between doing the selling and doing mm -hmm. the fulfillment and running the business and all of those right. pieces. So that can, if that starts to wear you out, uh, it is by no means, um, uh, giving up, selling out. There's like, I have literally no judgment for anybody who goes and takes a day job. And uh, I mean, I think that's just like, you have to follow your heart on these things and you have to choose fulfillment at the end of the day. So I love that. Um, I do want to get back to the, the work that you're doing. Um, right. You are in that role, still creating your own pipeline. And so how, yep. how are you doing that in this role at a company and how to, is that right. uh, similar to and different from what you were doing as a consultant? Well, a lot of that. So when I was talking about doing the shows, um, stuff like that, a lot of that was with Vision 33. Mm -hmm. So it, it's basically, you know, continuing that effort, building the pipeline, building the networks, finding the organizations where our prospects can be. Uh, like, for example, we were just at the New Jersey CPA Expo. Because mm -hmm. I sell accounting software. So, yeah. you know, there's probably a lot of people out there that either can partner with us or could be a potential client for us. So it, it's kind of like just putting myself in uh -huh. the places to where I can maximize my success. Because yeah. you have to remember, your time is precious. You yeah. can only be at one place at one time. And you've got to make sure that you're doing what is the best use of your time. Mm -hmm. It's a visibility strategy. And I I mm -hmm. really love that you're uh, um, bringing that up. It's like, we can't be here. We have to go where they are. And people who listen to the show know I'm bringing this up constantly. You have to go where your audience are. Uh, we can't always expect them to track us down. So anything I wanted to talk about that I really love that you are doing um, as an employee of a company is you have a really powerful personal brand that you have built right. and are continuing to build. And so I also want to say this because I know if anybody does, for example, decide that they want to take a day job, mm -hmm. never let go of your personal brand and building no. that. So can you talk a little bit about um, how you've built it and how you kind of negotiated that? Or did you need to negotiate yeah, yeah. that with your employer? Uh, it's a little bit of a struggle. They have nobody, for example, that does podcast interviews except for me. Well, they have we, we have Carl Lewis. He does mm -hmm. uh, another podcast, uh, the official Vision 33 podcast. Um, so, you know, he does one every now and then, but mostly, I mean, it's me out there being the face of it. And, you know, it just came down to don't do anything controversial yeah. and I should yeah. be okay. And so far I've kept myself clean and I have not got canceled. So I've been okay. But I mean, building my personal brand, whether it's my domain, davidstrausser.com or mm -hmm. whether it's my professional image and stuff like that, like that is one thing that I will never give up. And if I was to ask or to be forced about giving it up, mm -hmm. that's where I, I wouldn't be yeah. with the company yeah. that I am today, because they have to think about it this way, too. I mean, uh, it's a win win for them. The bigger that I boost my own brand, my own name, you know, they're following behind in the in my coattails in those instances. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's reverse. You're with mm -hmm. a big company and you're riding the coattails off, off of your company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it all depends on what the situation is, but it's usually a win-win for both parties as yeah. long as you're doing something that is positive, mm -hmm. not negative. Right. Reflecting and on even them. what it's negative. Sometimes it could be a positive. You know, you've, we've all heard the cliche that, you know, no press is bad press. So <laughs> it, it, it really just depends what it is. Mm -hmm. What what gets that attention? Right. Uh, and there is the portability of that brand. Should you one day decide to go somewhere else? And I think every good uh, business knows that and knows. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I think there is the risk of having a prominent employee, because I've seen mm -hmm. this a lot on LinkedIn, where you have somebody who builds a prominent brand as part of a different company, and then they leave that company and go somewhere else. But listen, that uh, that personal brand is the asset that you own. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it's you know, the invest only thing in that it. You own. Yeah, invest in it. Absolutely. 
And you know, the company has got to be willing to take the to the risk. You know, if they're good to you, if they're treating you well, guess what? You're probably not going to leave, mm -hmm. no matter how your your brand, you know, big your brand gets, unless Spotify offers you a hundred million dollar exclusive deal, you're probably going to stick around with them. And now we know your price, David. <laughs> yeah, hundred million. <laughs> That's the price tag I have. All right, I heard that Spotify. Well, cool. I would love to transition to talking about your podcast because you also do a video podcast and you yes. uh, you do that on YouTube. So, uh, and then uh, another thing we have in common is that we are these are um, pandemic babies. So you also started your podcast during the pandemic with all that, um, that good, uh, at home time. So yeah. what was, uh, how'd you come up with the name and what's <laughs> kind of like the theme and focus of it? So I came up with shark bite biz, believe it or not, it was all the way back in 2015. And it took me five years to actually launch the podcast. I always wanted to do the podcast. I had the equipment for the podcast, uh. but I decided again, when we just talked about better yeah. use of your time, I felt that, uh, you know, podcasting wasn't there yet and mm -hmm. that it was better used in live events. So that's where I went the live event networking type type route and put my energy and focus there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, COVID happens. I launched the podcast and the name, you know, a lot of people think it's, you know, like Shark Tank, but it yeah. has nothing to do with uh, Shark Tank, not trying to write off that at all. But when I think of business, you know, especially sales reps or business owners that are in the hustle, they're in the grit of just trying to to secede, you know, I, I view those mm -hmm. people as sharks, you know, yeah. Yeah. and it's kind of like bite first or get bitten. And <laughs> that's kind of the attitude that I took with the podcast, with the podcast name. Mm -hmm. And that's what the show's about. It's got yeah. three fundamental factors with the show, which is we talk about personal growth. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that come on the show uh, that do career transformations, you know, it's like they did this for 20 years and then like, yeah, I don't like this anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, one was a, a funeral director that ended up being a health and fitness coach. Wow. Um, yeah. So <laughs> like there's pretty crazy stuff. Yeah. You know, all that death gives you, a, all that death gives you a new perspective on life. Yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of career transformation, personal growth type stuff that comes out of it. Then there's the, the professional growth as far mm -hmm. as maturing as a, you know, a lot of people that listen to the show, I think they're young executives. They're kind of independent consultants. Um, by young executive, I don't mean necessarily age-wise. Mm -hmm. um, I mean more younger in their careers of being an executive or manager and they're looking for more and more professional advice from some of the top CEOs out there that may or may not be in their industry. So we focus around professional growth. And then lastly, we focus around business growth, mm -hmm. um, you know, because everybody at the end of the day, if you're listening to my show, you're going to want to grow your business, no matter if it's your own business or whether you're a manager of a business or just a sales rep at a, at a business, you're trying to figure out how to grow. And they're the three things all yeah. three have in common growth. So mm -hmm. to sum the show up, it's a show that's about growth. Love it. Love it. As you know, um, and so over, what have you learned over, let's see, over uh, 160, almost 170 episodes, what have you learned over that time about growth? Oh, oh, I've learned so much about growth. It's... Now, wh you know, while you're thinking, while you're thinking, I'd love to just point out oh, you have ahead. you have business owners, uh, you have rock stars, yeah. and um, uh, all, like uh, such a variety of businesses. You had Soledad O'Brien, like you have such yep. a variety of people on there. So, what uh, what is that? I've had Evan Sohn, CEO of Recruiter.com, uh, for example. Mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. actually, here, this is pretty solid. He, when he was on the show, you can. Um, watch the show and when it came out and remember that uh, I did record that a few episodes even before it aired and he said you know come fall the great resignation will end that's what all of our data says and uh, this was well over six months ago and he's a CNBC jobs recruiter you know it was kind of crazy but 
I think that's probably one of the biggest trends. And it's not just because I am in this industry, mm-hmm. but it's really just trusting the data, you know, trusting the data and being able to turn data into business intelligence. And that's one of the biggest things that that I've learned because a lot of these owners, you know, it was it comes down to them understanding their data to be able to make the right decisions Mm -hmm. just as evan was able to make his prediction about the great resignation ending you know it was because he was able to interpret the data pretty correctly for real there's been so much um i think dramatic change in Mm -hmm. uh in how we treat people and how people expect to be treated and things like that and um uh, as that kind of arched over the the two years that you and I've been recording, um, what other kind of themes do you see emerging from there? So definitely, you know, uh, I think remote work is here to stay. I mean, even when I talk to it with uh, with Soledad O'Brien, for example, since you've mentioned her, um, it was kind of we had the discussion about that, and for working professionals. If you're being hired by a company as a business professional, whether you're an accountant, whether you're a sales rep, whether you're, you know, doing whatever for them, okay, Uh, unless you physically have to be on site doing certain things, if it's work that you're able to complete from your home office, yeah, you know, really, it's not going to be a nine to five job anymore Mm -hmm. that, that those days are slowly dwindling oh yeah got tongue twisted there dwindling Mm -hmm. away that um you know it's going to become much more task orientated i think that's the biggest trend that i've seen that's Mm -hmm, one of the mm -hmm. big things that that a lot of people keep talking about like you know if you're completing all your work and you get it done in six hours or seven hours I, i don't care you know you did all the work you had i'm not going to make you sit an extra hour or two at your desk just for you know the fun of it um you know people are more efficient i mean it it really just comes down to uh the quality of work that people are putting out yeah i and i think that's uh to me it just speaks to a kind of an authenticity that kind of came in with uh i would say uh gen well the millennials and gen z is that uh and zennials and and Zennials, to your, to your credit. <laughs> now, I remember saying, if I can get this done in less time, like, what does it matter how long I'm I'm here? I also had uh, enlightened bosses who would say to me, like, I don't really care if you're here. Uh, if you, as long as you get the work done, we don't care. And I think right. having that uh, idea spread, it just seems more like authentic and real yep. and sensible. Um, and so I really cheer that, but I do feel that kind of old guard resisting um, and yeah. wondering where does that end. And so I'm I'm really curious to see. It all uh, depends on, on the battle. company. I, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, it's battling out right now in front of our eyes with big mm-hmm. tech. Um, a lot of I know a lot of small businesses, especially some that are our customers that they've gone completely remote. They're like, oh, we're just going to get a virtual office. Why are we spending so much for an office building? Everybody can work remote. This works fine. And that's Mm -hmm. all that they do for their office employees. So yeah, I mean, look, there's certain work that you have to do between nine and five, Mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Like there there are some things that have to be done between nine and five between nine and five, prioritize those, get those items done. Okay. Right, right, right. It's, you know, this is crazy. Talk to some people and to others. It's like, yep. this is how I've been working for the last 20 years. So yeah, I know um, this is how I've been working for the last, you know, except for my younger days, having to work in some retail, but for the yeah. most part, since maybe 2000, I think 2007 ish around there. Uh, when I started uh, with a company called System Circulation Partners, that was the start of my work from home, wow. you know, independent consultant type career. And, you know, since then, I've kind of always known that I didn't want to be in an office. Sure. Like even yeah. with my current company, first mm-hmm. three months, I had to go while I was on boarding. Okay. Yeah. After right. that, and they trusted me. It was like once a week, you know, and then after, you know, he turned into their top sales rep, it's like, yeah, show up when, when you need to, you know, <laughs> uh, and exactly. that turned into barely ever, but I mean, yeah. that's what their mentality is because again, task oriented. I mean, I've done 
sales demos while on layovers in Colombia. Okay. Right. So, you know, while I'm on vacation, uh, I have a lot of stories like that because I come from the mentality sales never sleep. Doesn't matter if I'm on vacation. That's people going above and beyond. And if you're able to do that, that's where I think you deserve, you own the right to have that flexibility if you're willing to do that. And yeah. if your company doesn't allow you to, then maybe that's not the right fit for you. For real, for real. Uh, it's a great story of dedication. Uh, oh, yeah. Where can our listeners go and learn more about you? Oh, so multiple places, okay? Uh, the easiest place is you can go to uh, sharkbitebiz.com. Uh, that is where you can find out all the links for the show, stuff like that, or just uh, search for Shark Bite Biz on YouTube. That's probably the easiest to see all the episodes. You can find out about me personally at davidstrausser.com. And then lastly, uh, I would say that you can... Uh, go to, if you're interested in ERP, accounting software, stuff like that, you would go to vision33.com um, or reach out to me at david.strausser at vision33.com and uh, we'll make sure that we'll take good care of you. Perfect. All of that will be in the show notes in case you didn't get a chance awesome. to write that down. Uh, David, it has been such a pleasure to talk with you. And I really appreciate the um, the perspective that you bring on building your own pipeline and how you mm -hmm. model uh, your dedication to the craft of sales and um, the yeah. art of sales, which I also am such a big fan of. So thank you so much for being with awesome. us. And I'm to our very listeners, grateful for being on. Thank, thank you. you. And to our listeners, I want to wish you a profitable and joyful consulting company. Thanks for watching. I'd appreciate it if you'd like this episode. And if you enjoyed the show, why not subscribe? Be sure to click the bell to get notified when new episodes drop.